Okay, welcome everybody. Um, while we're waiting for people to join us, just in case there's anyone figuring out Zoom and things, it would be lovely to know where everyone is in the world. Um, I'm in the UK, just outside London, so if you'd like to share your location, um, just put it in the chat so we can see. Avery from Toronto. Lisa in the US. Oh, Graham, Chelmsford, UK. I've never been to Chelmsford. I'm in Tunbridge Wells. So for anyone who doesn't know me already, my name is Claire and I'm one of the TAs at Launch School. I'm also a student. I'm just over halfway through the Ruby track. This is the first in a series of introductory workshops on Ruby. It's also a set of workshops on JavaScript. And then there's a third set on miscellaneous topics such as yesterday's um, where Trevor was describing his um, study tips. These workshops are designed to complement Launch School's programming and back end prep Ruby course. As introductory sessions, they'll give you a flavour for launch school and what to expect, but they're not a substitute for working through the course materials. So let's have a look at what we will be covering today. So those are the workshop titles and here is the content. So we're going to be looking at um, what Ruby is and how do we use it. We're going to look at basic data types and operators type conversion, so converting between different data types, basic data structures, which in Ruby are arrays and hashes, um, variables, and then we're going to um, finish up by looking at output and return, and what's the difference between them. Now, if you have any questions as we go along, please put them in the Q&A. You can put them in the chat, but they might get a bit, a bit lost. If you put them in the q and I'm much more likely to see them. I'll try to answer them as we go because I don't want to leave anyone behind and this is a safe space to learn and ask questions. If you've got a question, the chances are that other people are thinking the same thing. There'll be time at the end for further questions and I'll post a link to a form so you can leave your feedback about this workshop and how to improve for next time. I've actually posted the form. I'm going to do that now. Um, I'll post it here in the chat. So. If anyone needs to hop off early, then um, please grab that form, fill it in, let us know what worked, what didn't work, any suggestions you've got to improve these workshops is really gratefully received. Um, everything in this workshop is covered in the Launch School Ruby book. So don't worry about taking notes. If you want to code along with me, then please go ahead. Don't worry if it doesn't work for you, though, because I'll be using multiple choice quizzes throughout to keep things interactive. Now, these quizzes are just for fun. They're anonymous. No one's recording anything. So it's just a, a good chance to just uh, check understanding and just to keep us all engaged. I'm going to be working in AWS Cloud 9, which you can see on the left of uh, my screen share. AWS Cloud9 effectively provides a website where you can program. It actually provides a lot more than that, but that's all we need to know for the moment. So it just provides an environment where we can code. And we recommend AWS as it's easier for us to support students when they're at the beginning of their learning journey. But if you've got your own environment that you prefer, then feel free to use that. That's absolutely fine. We just use Cloud9 because it's something that... Um, people can use without having to set too much stuff up. Okay, so um, let's have a look. So what is Ruby and how do we use it? So Ruby <clears throat> was created by Yukihiro Matsumoto or Mats in Japan in the mid 1990s. It was designed with the idea that programming should be fun and emphasizes the necessity for software to be understood by humans first and computers second. So it's a very readable language. Um, just to make us all feel a little inadequate, Matt's built his first programming language when he was just 17 years old and it 
wasn't Ruby, but it did inspire many of the features that were later incorporated into it. Ruby is a general purpose language. It can be used for many different tasks. You can build desktop applications, static website, you can do data processing, create web servers. It, it's a great all purpose language. In this workshop, we're going to work with IRB, which is short for Interactive Ruby. And it's a program environment where we can explore Ruby without having to create files. You simply type in Ruby code, press enter, and it executes it. So on the left-hand side of the screen here, I'm in the terminal, this is the command line. And all I do is type IRB and enter. And that means I'm now in interactive Ruby. So in here, I can just type Ruby code. So one plus two, press enter. And it gives me a um, return value of three, as you'd expect. And I can also put in code. So I can do um, the command put S that just outputs whatever you pass to it. So I'm passing hello here. So we can see hello is output. So this is IRB um, and to exit IRB and get back to the normal command line, you just type exit and then that just gets you back to where you were before. So let's have a look at some basic data types and operators so you can see them there. We're going to look at the simplest data types used in Ruby, which are strings, symbols, integers, floats, nil, and boolean. And then we're going to look at some of the operators that we can use with them. So firstly, let's look at strings. These are just a list of characters in a specific order. They could be specific words, sentences, or even codes that include numbers and other special characters. All these things are strings. In Ruby, we create these using single or double quotes. So let me demonstrate that. So I'm going to go back into IRB, I think IRB. So to create a string, you can use single quotes, oops, like that. Or we can use double quotes. It doesn't matter. Either one creates a string. Ruby doesn't um, care whether you do it with single quotes or double quotes. And as I said, you can put in numbers and symbols. And that is also a string. If you want to create a string that includes quotes, then you can put, or apostrophes, then you can put single quotes inside double quotes. So if I wanted to put an apostrophe, so I want to do she's coding like that, because I've created the string using double quotes, I can use a single apostrophe quote in that and Ruby won't end the string. It knows it's part of the string. And you can do the same the other way around of putting double quotes inside single quotes. So if I do a single quote here, he said hello, and then end it with the single quote. You can see there Ruby accepts those double quotes as being part of the string. What you can also see here are some backslashes. Let's highlight it there. Now, um, these are called escape characters. And what it's telling us is that Ruby is ignoring these double quotes, this one here and this one here. It's ignoring the double quotes that are appearing after this escape character in terms of ending the string. So it knows that this double quote here is an ending the string that started right here that he said. Also the same for this one. It, it, whereas this last double quote right at the end doesn't have a backslash in front of it. So Ruby knows that that is in fact ending the string. So that's quite useful to know. You can use these backslashes in single quotes or double quotes. So something like that, if I wanted to put an apostrophe inside single quotes, I can use the backslash um, like this. Um, so the escape character is really useful. So moving on to operators with, um, I'm going to answer this question. So there's no difference at all between double quotes and single quotes for strings. No, 
is the one that's considered as better style, both truly identical. There is something you can do inside double quotes, which is put a variable inside it, which you can't do in single quotes. So that might be a reason that you choose one over the other. But generally, it's a styling thing. Whichever one you choose, try to be consistent in your code so that it doesn't look like there's a significance behind you using one or the other. But in terms of what Ruby cares about, single or double quotes is fine. Great question. OK, sorry. So I said I was going to move on to operators. So one of the things you can do is foo. And you can use the plus symbol and bar. And what this does is it concatenates strings, so it puts them together. So you can see that does foo bar. And if we want to, say, um, put two strings together, but we want a space between them, we could do that by adding three strings together like that, and that will come out hello world with the space in between. So this is called string concatenation, and that's what the plus symbol does. Now I'm going to show you just a couple of um, methods you can use with strings. So I'm just going to clear my screen so it doesn't get too cluttered. So something else you can do is if we have a string and then we do dot up case, we're invoking a method upcase and it does what we think it would it upcases the letters in that string so it returns hi um and as you might expect there is also a downcase method so by downcase returns all of the letters downcased um and then let's show you another one flowers dot chop that takes the last letter of the string. And there are, there are lots of useful string methods in Ruby. It's a great language. It's got lots of useful um, methods in it. And you invoke them by doing dot and then the method. So now we've looked at strings, let's have a look at symbols. So I'm going to clear the screen again. So I can press the up arrow. In Cloud9, lots of systems do this to bring back previous commands. So I can just clear the screen again. So strings um, are created with quotes, whereas symbols are created with a colon. They're similar to strings, but they use for specific purposes, like um, looking, you, like uh, a key for looking up information. And we're going to see that later. For now, you can just think of them as unchangeable strings. So just colon name, that's a string. Um, oh, I can't spell flowers. Um, flowers, that's another symbol. I said string before. These are both symbols because they've got the colon before them and you can't change them. Um, whereas strings you can change so if I created a variable and I called it flower what I can do is reassign the letters in that string um, which is something we'll come on to later but I can change just the first character in that string um, I can't do it here, I'll show you later, but you can, strings are not immutable, so you can change them. Whereas, um, oh, I can see what I did, it's because I didn't make this a string. Um, there we go. So now if I output bar, it's changed to clower. So I got an error up here because I said it was equal to C, and so Ruby is going, I, there's a variable called C that I don't know of. Um, whereas actually I wanted to say it was equal to the, character the string c so that's why i needed to put the quotes around it here and so we can see here that i can change a string so strings are mutable whereas you cannot do the same thing for um so if i do var2 if i call that flower i cannot change it so if i did var to try to change the first character in there, try to change it to C. 
um, Ruby says no, there, it, there isn't a method for doing this. There isn't this square bracket method for changing a um, symbol. That's why symbols are useful in certain contexts where you don't want to be able to change the string. You can use a symbol instead. So moving on to numbers. So let's do a system clear again. Um, that's a good question. No, it wouldn't. So if I did var zero, so someone has asked if I did var two zero and said it was equal to C, would that work? No, it wouldn't. So you can't, you cannot change a symbol once it's created, it's created and it cannot be changed. Okay, so I hope that answers that question. And I guess it's just important because it's, when you first come across strings and symbols, it's not obvious what the difference is and why would you would use one over the other. And that is why you would use one over the other. You cannot change symbols. You can't accidentally reassign one of the characters to be something else and then your keys not work. Right, so let's go on to numbers. So there are um, two types of numbers that Ruby uses, integers and floats. Float is just another name for a decimal, short for floating point number. And in Ruby, create is very straightforward. So 123, just created 123, 4.56, created 4.56. These can be combined with all the usual mathematical operators that I showed you before. You can do one plus two. And do eight minus three. Um, what about three times four? We use the asterisk to do multiplication. And then division is using the forward slash. So four divided by two gives you two. Now you do need to be careful when you're dividing using integers because integers will always be returned. So if I do three divided by two, we know that's 1.5. Ruby thinks it's one. In order to get an accurate answer, we need to turn one of them into a float. So you can either do 3.0 divided by two or three divided by 2.0. Both of those will give you an accurate answer. So it's just something to be aware of that when you're using the um, division with integers, you will get integers back, even if that's not an accurate answer. And the last, oh no, not the last one. So another operator is exponentiation. So two to the power of three. So two times two times two. Um, you use a double asterisk for that. So that gives you eight. And then lastly, we've got the modulo operator. Now there is a difference between modulo and remainder. That is to do with what happens when you use negative numbers. And I'm not going to go into that today. That's mathematical. Just be aware that when you're using modulo, it's a great way to get remainder. So two goes into five twice. What matters is there's one left over. If we do nine modulo three, because three goes into nine three times exactly, there's no remainder left over, so we get zero. And the only time you would need to worry that modulo isn't exactly the same as remainder in a mathematical context is when you're using negative numbers. So it might not give you the answer you expect, so just experiment with it to just check that it is giving you what you wanted. So that's numbers. So let's clear the screen again. So now we're going to move on to nil. Um, so nil is a way to express nothing, and it's always returned by the method put s. So to create nil, we just type nil. And then if we use the method put s to output the string hello, on the first line after it, hello is output, and then this equals and greater than sign, which we call the hash rocket. Um, this is what the code is returning. 
and that is nil. So put S, whatever string you pass to it, it always returns nil. So it outputs the string that you pass to it, but it returns nil. And we, we will look at this um, as the last topic that we're looking at, but it's just a good way to demonstrate what nil is, where it comes from. It's just saying nothing is being returned by this. Um, the difference, so I've got a question here. What is the difference between print and put S? The difference is that they both output a string. They both return nil, but put S when it outputs a string, puts a carriage return on the end. So the next thing will appear on the next line, whereas print doesn't put a carriage return on the end of the string. So the next thing will appear right next to it. So when we do print hello, we end up getting the output here is hello. And then the hash rocket nil showing the return is right up against it. So that's the difference between print and put s. Okay. So then the final data type we're going to look at is Boolean. So these are just true and false values without quotes. So I can just create here, true and false. These are the two Boolean um, values in Ruby. There, are, there isn't a third one, it's just true or false. And these are the results you get when you compare different values using um, equality operators. So for example, if I do four, double equals four. So the double equals um, symbol just compares the values of two different things. So this is just saying, is four the same as four? And Ruby says, yes, it is. So it returns a Boolean, it returns true. Whereas if I did something like four and three, Ruby will come back and say, no, four is not the same value as three. We can also use this on strings. So is yes the same as no? Ruby says, no, it's not. But is yes the same as yes? Ruby says, yeah, they are the same. Um, you can even use these to compare values that are different data types, but it can be a bit unpredictable. So is four the same as true? Ruby says, no, it isn't, which is good because it's not. Um, and then bat, is that the same as nil? No, it says it's not. So these are um, behaving as we would expect, but do be careful when you mix data types. Another thing to be careful of is that we are using here the double equals operator, as I showed you earlier with a variable the single equals operator um, assigns a value to a particular variable. Now, in a whole page of code, a double equals can look very similar to a single equals. So be careful. Um, I've tripped up on that more times than I would care to admit, because they're just it's so easy to mistake one for the other. So it's something that when you're debugging your code is always <laughs> worth checking that you're using a single equals when you want to and a double equals when you want to. Um, and there's also a not equals operator. So if I do four is not equal to four, it returns the opposite of what the double equals does. So it's four not equal to four. Well, four equal to four would return true. So with an apostrophe, um, not an apostrophe, an exclamation mark, and equals, this is saying not, so it returns the opposite, so this would be false. Again, you can use this with strings as well. So is yes, not the same as no, Ruby says, yes, that's true. Yes is not the same as no. Right, so I could do with a break from talking. So um, to finish this first section, we are going to have a mini quiz to explore the equality operator and what these will return. Remember, this is just for fun, so give it a go. We'll go through the answers together and there might be a few things in there that we've not covered. And so this gives us an opportunity to look at those as well. So I'm just going to um, launch this poll and um, we'll come back and look at the answers once you've had a chance to complete the poll.
Let's have a nervous 30 seconds or so before anyone's submitted. <laughs> but once a couple of people have, I know that you can see the poll. Okay, I'll just give another 30 seconds or so for anyone that's just getting used to the um, interface of the quizzes. Okay, so I'm just going to end that poll and then share the results so you can all see. And then let's have a look at the answers. Okay. So um, for the first question, four compared to 4.0, they're different data types. One is an integer and one is a float. Um, but Ruby can compare the values of um, integers and floats. Um, so it just returns true and says, yeah, four is the same as 4.0. Question two is when um, we're comparing integers and strings. So is four, the number, the same as string, the num uh, four, the string. Now, when comparing integers and strings, Ruby always returns false. Even though it looks to us like they're the same value, Ruby doesn't think they are. So this is something to be aware of. Question three. Please see that everyone got this right. So it doesn't matter whether a string is in double quotes or single quotes. It's the same thing. So Ruby knows that these are the same. Question four. Um, comparing false to nil. Again, um, this is false. Ruby knows that false and nil are different things. So when you try to compare them, Ruby says, no, they're not the same. And then um, question five, when comparing symbols and strings, again, this is similar to comparing integers and strings. It doesn't matter what the symbols and strings are, Ruby will always return false. They're not the same thing. Even though to us they might look like they have the same value, Ruby says no. Now, um, now we've learned about some basic data types. Let's have a look at converting between them. So type conversions. So you can see there, there's three methods we're going to look at for converting between data types. So the first one is 2i, and that converts to integers. So if we give it a string, say 14, and then we do dot to i to invoke the to i method, Ruby will convert that to a string. So it says, yeah, it's 14. Now, if we do 2.9 and convert that to an integer, um, does anyone want to put in the chat, guess what, what do you think that might return? Promise you no one's keeping records, no one's, yes, two, 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 brilliant, you're right turns to so it returns the number that is to the left of the decimal place and ignores everything else and then we can see that it does the same when we do a symbol 2.9 to i it also returns to so it just returns everything to the left of the decimal place it's not rounding it it's just passing it's just returning the integer part of it back now let's look at 2f. So 2f is converting to a float. So we can do the same thing we did with integer and we can put a float inside a string and then convert it to a float. And Ruby comes back and says that's 
um, if we do the number six, so if we convert an integer to a float, Ruby puts a point zero on the end of it, which you saw before when I was um, showing the limitation of dividing by integers by turning one of them into a float, Ruby then gave you an accurate answer. So you can see for Ruby to think that a number is a float, all you need to do is put a point zero on the end of it if you don't have any other decimal places to put there. Then the last conversion is 2s. And this converts things to strings. So if we do one, then 2s, that returns one as a string. And then we could do 2.9 for s, that converts to 2.9. And we can also convert a symbol to a string, which can be useful. That returns the um, name of the symbol as a string. So. If I do that again, this one, just to make it clear, we get back the string name. OK, so let's have another mini quiz. Now, some of the some of the questions are not things we've explicitly covered. So they're just designed to demonstrate what we can and can't do with these conversion methods. So give it your best shot and I'll explain the new concepts afterwards. So type conversions, launch that poll. I should probably come off this screen so there's no cheating. There we go. Give it a go. Okay, I'll give another 30 seconds or so. See, there's a nice spread of answers for quite a few of the questions. So there's lots to learn here, which is great. Just give you a little bit longer. If um, there's anyone that is um, struggling to fill in the quizzes in the time that I'm allowing, put something in the chat and I'll change it. But I don't want everyone just sitting around not doing anything because um, you finished the poll. So let's finish it there. I'll share the results and then put the answers up. Okay. So for the first question, um, six to i, this is converting an integer to an integer. So that just returns the integer. Ruby doesn't complain. It just does what you asked it to do and just returns an integer. Um, for question two here, we're converting a string to an integer. Now this returns zero. It doesn't um, give you an error. Um, when the string doesn't have a number in it, it just always returns zero. It doesn't matter what characters you've got in here. If they're not numbers, it always returns zero. So that is something that's useful to know. Question three. We're here. Question three is um, 
using 2i on a Boolean. Now there is no method defined for converting a Boolean to an integer. So question three, that raises an error. Question four, for a number in quotes, so a string number, if you convert that to a float, then Ruby returns the number as a float. So it returns 6.0. So it's able to tell that that is a number and it gives you the float equivalent of it. Question five here, we've got um, a string to a float. So this is similar to question two. And rather than returning zero when you're um, converting something to an integer, when you're converting it to a float, Ruby returns 0, 0.0. Uh, question six, um, converting a Boolean to a float. There's no method for that. So Ruby says, you didn't mean to do that. That's an error. Um, and then the last one, converting a Boolean to a string. Um, there is a method for that. And Ruby does return the Boolean value as a string. So it returns false now. It can be hard to remember all of these, so that is not the purpose of this quiz. Um, when you're programming, if you're ever unsure about what a conversion will return, jump into IRB and check it out. The point I'm making here is that it can be unpredictable. So if you're getting unexpected results when you're coding and you're using any of these conversions, check that they're doing what you thought they would, because they might well be where your bug is because it's a bit unpredictable. Okay, so now we are going to... Do I know why a i returns the integer zero and what the logic is behind it? No, I don't know that. And I wonder whether other languages um, do that as well to maybe follow the same convention. I don't know why. I think for me, it would be better if Ruby returned an error, because clearly that's not what you wanted to do, but it doesn't, it doesn't raise an error, it just returns zero. So no, I don't know why string to I to this question here. Question two returns zero rather than an error, but great question. Okay. So now we are moving on to basic data structures. So there are two basic data structures used in um, Ruby, arrays and hashes. They both let you store multiple pieces of data inside a single object, so they're really useful. Let's look at arrays first. So arrays are an ordered list. You can have any data type in them. They can be a mixture of data types in a single array. They're denoted by square brackets and each element has an index starting at zero for the first item. Now, starting at zero when counting um, elements might seem unintuitive if this isn't something you've come across before. Um, and it's certainly caught me out a few times. One way to think about this is when you look inside an array, you begin at the first element. If you want to see what the second element is, you need to take one step. If you want to see what the third element is, and you're starting at the first one, you need to take two steps. So the index is two. So you can think of the index as the number of steps you need to take to get from the first index to the one that you're looking at. So let's have a look. If I do a system clear again. Oh dear. Let's create an array. So. It's just comma delimited, so commas between each item. So here I've created an array of the numbers one, two, and three. As I said, you can put um, strings in there. So I could put red and orange. So that's an array with two elements in it. Um, and you can put all you can put any data types in. So we could um, put a mixture of data types. In so there I've got nil, false, and a symbol. And Ruby will accept those as well. Um, and then I'm just going to quickly show you index referencing. So if I have a well, I'm not gonna do that. 
if I have three elements, A, B, and C, if I want to see what is in the first index, if I want to see what the first element of this array is, I need to look at the zero index. And I do that by, by doing square brackets after the array with the number of the index that I want to look at. So this will bring back A because it's at the zeroth index. If I change that to one, I get B. If I change it to two, I get C. Okay, so let's have another mini quiz. Um, I'd like you to tell me what these are going to return. And again, no, it's not that one. This one. Um, these are designed to make you think a bit. Okay, so again, I've not demonstrated everything, but I will when we go through the answers to this. So don't worry if you're not certain. It's good to think about these things and see if you can predict what's going on. So here's a quick quiz on arrays. Yeah, so don't worry if you're not sure of the answers, you've not missed anything. We will go through it. Okay, I'll give another 30 seconds or so. Okay, so let's finish it there. Let's share those results. And then I'll show you the answers. So here we go. So um, question one is demonstrating um, how to reference an element in an array. And um, you can see everyone got that right. So the element at index one is the number two. So that's what's returned. Um, for question two, we're trying to reference an element that doesn't exist. So we've got 0, 1, 2. There is no element at index number three. And whilst we, we might like this to return an error, because it will be useful to know that we're trying to get something that doesn't exist, um, Ruby um, returns nil. Again, it's something to be aware of just because you don't get an error doesn't mean the code has necessarily worked as you expected. Um, for question three, the um, value at the zero index is apple. And question four is demonstrating um, negative integers. And these um, reference elements from um, right to left rather than left to right. So when we have positive integers, this is counting from left to right. But when we have negative integers, it's doing it the other way around. So if I pull back this one, so minus one will give you the very last element. So in this case, A, B, C, it will give you C. And if I do two, it gives you the second one from the end, which is B. And if I do three, we get the third one from the end, which is A. So for question four, because we've passed in the index minus one, banana is the last element in that array, so we get that banana. 
now. And negative, yes, so minus four would return nil. Let's demonstrate that. Good question. So we get nil. So again, there isn't an element at minus four. We'd like an error, I would, um, but we get nil. So good prediction there. Um, right, so question five. This is demonstrating um, referencing elements in nested arrays, which is something I didn't show you. So the first index references. So for question five, we want the element at index two. So Bugs Bunny is at um, index naught, Daffy Duck is at index one. And so it is an inner array, Wile E. Coyote and Roadrunner, that whole array that is at index two. And so that is what is returned. And then for question six, we can see how to reference an element inside an array that's inside another array. And you do that by having a series of um, square brackets with the indices in. So we learned on the previous example that with just a two referencing after it, we would get Wiley, Coyote and Roadrunner. And so off of that, we're then asking for the element at index one. And so within that inner array, the element at index one is Roadrunner. And you can nest and nest and nest and nest. I mean, whether you should do that is not a question. But you can do it, and so you can just keep popping on these square brackets with the indices in there. And that's how you reference elements in nested arrays. And sometimes you do want to nest an array within an array. It's useful to do. So now we are going to move on to hashes. So um, we saw that arrays were denoted by square brackets. Hashes are denoted by curly brackets. They're similar to arrays in that they contain a set of data, but they're different to arrays in that the data is stored in sets of pairs. So each pair contains a key. So here we've got Roadrunner is the key and Meep is the value. Daffy is the key and Death Pickable is the value. When you provide the key, Ruby returns the value. Now, Hashes are sometimes referred to as a dictionary, and that provides a really useful analogy because the key can be thought of as what will be the word that you might look up in a dictionary. And the value is like the meaning that you would find. So I found this quite useful to um, remember what was going on in a hash. It's these, these pairs of things that are related to each other. Now, let's clear my screen again. So to create a hash, you just do curly braces and it's useful to have um, symbols as the keys because then they cannot be changed. Then we use the hash rocket between the key and the value. Um, so that has created a hash with a single key value pair in it. If we want one with um, several, pairs in it, we use a comma to delimit them. So I'm going to put dog box and then cat meows. And then we can do the last one. We can do pig. Oops. Like that. So you can see there. We've got three pairs of values in there, dog box, cat meows, and pig oinks. And we just put a comma between them to separate the three different pairs. Now, um, you can, I've used symbols here because it's a great use of a symbol, but the key doesn't have to be a symbol. It can be an integer and the value could be a Boolean. Um, you could also use um, just a string. Um, and I could put a decimal here. So you, you can mix it up. It's, it's commonplace to use symbols as the keys, useful, but sometimes there are very good reasons for not doing it. So it's not something that you have to do. Um, 
just like with arrays, we can reference single values from a hash. So I'll use the up arrow key here to get back that hash that I've created here. So symbol, um, similarly to arrays, we use the square brackets for this. Um, with arrays, we pass in the index number. And with hashes, we will pass in the key. So in this case, my keys are symbols. So I'm going to pass in um, the symbol. So if I pass in the symbol cat, I'll get back out meows. OK, so um, let's now compare arrays and hashes. So when you first start using arrays and hashes, it's not always obvious which is the right tool for the job. They're both still sets of data. So how do you know which one to use? A simple rule of thumb is that if your data has labels, use a hash. If your data has an order, use an array. Um, another distinction can be to think of arrays as being useful to store collections of the same data type, even though you can put different data types in them, um, like a series of temperatures over a time period. Whereas a hash would be useful to store different weather data related to a particular day. So if you wanted to store a temperature, a rainfall and a wind speed, then that's the reason that you might use a hash because you want to label each piece of data with what it's representing. If you're familiar with arrays and hashes look a little intimidating, just remember that elements in an array are referenced using integers. So I'll demonstrate again. So one, two, three, four. So we want to get um, the value at index two back. So the number three, we use the index number, whereas for hashes, we use the key. And that is that is kind of the difference between them. And the more you use hashes, um, the less scary they become and the more useful um, they become to you as well, because you can see that there's certain things that you can, information you can store using a hash that will be quite complicated to do with an array when you can't label each element with something. So um, let's finish this section on beta data structures um, with a mini quiz on which data structure you would choose for different things. So let's get the next poll up. So basic data structures. So give this a go. There's just four questions there. Um, and be aware that we are running over time. I've been quite chatty, I'm sorry about that. Okay, well done. Let's look at those answers. So for the first question, a collection of heights and meters, these are all measuring the same thing. So therefore, I would use an array. There's no need to label each of these heights with anything. I don't know anything more about them. They're just a collection of heights, so I'd use an array. Um, question two, it's a list of information about a person. I don't know if Bugs Bunny is single, but um, I'd use a hash here so that I can label them as your name, species, age, marital status. For question three, again, this is a collection of different data types. So a uh, hash would be good here too. 
And then for question four, this is a collection of single data types, things to buy. So an array would be appropriate for that. I mean, there, there's no right or wrong answer here. There's just kind of what might be better. Um, so don't worry too much about that if you have different answers. But those are the reasons why I would pick the particular um, data structures that I would. So variables. So variables store information that can be used later in a program, which I showed earlier. It's important to give them meaningful names, unlike what I did. Um, so our programs can be understood by other people and ourselves when we come back to them. And variables can be thought of as containers that hold information. And their sole purpose is to label and store data. And the equal sign is used to assign values to variables. So let's just clear the screen. So if I want to do first name, I can say that's bugs and I can do last name. Oops, funny. So you can see here that I've assigned the string bugs to the variable first name and the string bunny to the variable last name. So now they are stored. I don't need to keep writing bugs and bunny. I can do something like first name then i'll put a space between them and then put last name and then i'll get out bugs bunny um do be careful like i said that um that when you are assigning values to variables that you are using the single equal sign and when you are comparing values of two different things that you're using the double equal sign. So if I did first name, is that the same as last name? Um, Ruby says no, bugs is not the same as bunny. So that's great. But if I accidentally a single equals there, I've now reassigned first name to bunny, which we can see there if I just execute it. So if I now did, is first name the same as last name? Ruby returns true, it is, because I have pointed first name to the same thing that last name is pointing to. So that's just to show you how easy it is to um, get confused in what is going on in your code if you accidentally put a double equals when you should have put a single equals or a single equals when you should have put a double equals. Um, two things to note about variables before we move on to the last topic. Both of these are covered in detail in Launch School's Ruby course. So I'm just mentioning them here and I'm not going to explain them at depth. Now, there are different types of variables. The ones I've created here, they're called local variables. There are also constants, global variables, class variables, instance variables. They're all used for different purposes. They all have slightly different rules. Um, and that's covered in more detail in the course. But it's just something to be aware of that what I'm creating here is, um, I shouldn't look at the questions while I'm talking. Um, Point I'm making here is just that what I have created here are called local variables. So when we talk about variables, sort of generally, often we can mean that we're talking about local variables, but there are different types. Um, so someone is asking, so now the third line would print bugs, bugs, um, bunny, bunny. I think you find bunny, bunny, because both first name and last name are now assigned to Bunny. So, um, so the first point that I wanted to uh, make you aware of is that variables come in different types. And then the second was that variables point to objects. So two variables like first name and last name can both point to the same object, which we saw when first name was reassigned to the same string as last name. So when we think of um, variables as being buckets that sort of store things, that can come a little unstuck when you're thinking of two things pointing to the same thing. So that's why this 
um, diagram here, right hand side of student notes, um, both greeting and was up are both pointing to the same string, hello. So think of variables as pointers again. The course goes into that in much more detail. Now, the last topic we're going to talk about, sorry, um, is output versus return. <clears throat> I'm losing my voice. <laughs> Excuse me. Right, so when you first start programming with Ruby, understanding the difference between output and return might not seem obvious. One way to demonstrate it is how I demonstrated it earlier. So just do a system clear. So when we use the put s method, we can see it clearly here. Hello is what is being output to the console. That's what the user can see. And nil is being returned. So if I wanted to use the value that came from that expression, put s hello, I, I would be using nil. Um, so one of the ways to demonstrate this is to just create two variables that point to the same value. So if I do A and assign it to three and B, I'm also going to assign it to three. Now, both variables A and B are pointing to the same integer. So if I compare them and do A, is it the same value as B? Ruby comes back and says it's true. Yes, they do. So if I do put S A compared to B, you can see here that Ruby outputs the value that is that are inside these brackets here. They're optional, you can, as I showed up here, you can just pass a string without any brackets or you can put brackets in. Um, so Ruby outputs the value that it's been passed, true, but it returns nil. Doesn't matter what you pass to put S, it always returns nil. So here you can see that the output and the return are different. And so it's important to know that they're different. Let's look at the um, output and return of a few other expressions. So if we do a um, and reassign a to one, this doesn't have an output. There's nothing there. Um, if it does have a return value, it returns the value that the variable is assigned to. So it's returned one. There's no output, but it has returned one. Um, and then <clears throat> similar to put s, there is another method called p. And if we do p, this outputs the value that's passed to it, and it also returns it. So that can be useful for debugging. Um, because if you use put s, you might get you might change your method to return nil when actually you wanted it to return a value. And so p can be quite useful for that. So just good to know that p outputs and returns the same thing. It's not returning nil. And then um, as I demonstrated before, print um, outputs the value like put s does, but it doesn't put a carriage return after it. Um, and then it outputs then it returns nil, just like put s. So let's just do a quick quiz to explore um, output versus return. Again, um, don't worry if you're unsure some of the questions, I'll go through it when we look at the answers, just give you a best shot. Um, I should have said for anyone that um, needs to leave early, um, feel free to leave early, um, but don't forget to fill in the feedback form. So I'll put it in there.
So I've put the feedback form in the chat again for anyone that needs to um, leave. Um, it should only be another 10 minutes, I reckon. That depends how many questions you ask. Because of the limitations of um, writing quizzes in Zoom, some of the formatting of this has made these questions trickier than they would otherwise be. So just do your best. Another 20 seconds or so. Okay. Let's share those results. And show you the answers. You can see how close to the end we are here. Um, okay, so question one, um, when we do put S, Y, U, W, S, C, O, E, W, A, B, I, T, um, this will output the string that was passed to it um, and it will return nil. So that's the first two questions. It will output the string that was passed and it will return nil. Um, for the second question, we are assigning... Um, put S neat neat, the return of this expression to catchphrase. So what does this output? Now, because put S neat neat is a put S expression, it always returns nil. So actually we have assigned nil to catchphrase, or we've assigned catchphrase to nil. Um, and because of that, when we um, output it by doing put S, catchphrase we're actually doing put s nil which i think i'll do over here on, in the console so we do put s nil um it doesn't output anything it returns nil because put s always returns nil but it doesn't output anything so nothing is the answer to that and then nil is the um answer to what that returns because put s always returns nil even when you do put s on nil itself um and then what is output by the code Marvin age um, being assigned to 74? That will output nothing because you're not asking anything to be output here. There's no P, print or put S. Um, but for the last question, what will be returned? 74 is returned. So the value that the variable is being assigned to is the thing that is returned. And I have a question here. Um, to confirm a variable is assigned to a value, not the other way around, right? Like, you know, a value is assigned to a variable. I think I've probably been quite loose in this language when I've been talking. You, you could talk either way around, but I think it would be more accurate to say that a variable is assigned to a value rather than a value being assigned to a variable just because a value could be assigned to several variables, whereas a variable will only be assigned to one value. So it's more appropriate to say that Marvin age has been assigned to the integer 74. I think that would be a more accurate way of speaking. Right, so why is question three outputting nothing instead of the string that's because let's let's copy this let's do system clear so put s neat neat that's the expression because it's put s it actually is outputting neat neat but it's returning nil so catchphrase 
equals put s meet meep means the catchphrase is being assigned to nil. So if I do that, and then let's use the p. If I do p catchphrase to see um, what catchphrase is assigned to, catchphrase is assigned to nil. And so when I then do put s, put s catchphrase, nothing is output, nil is returned because it's always returned. Um, and that's because put s nil outputs nothing, but it returns nil. So that answered that question. Great question. Um, okay, so well done, everyone. We've got to the end. What have we covered? We looked at what Ruby is and we looked at how to use it. Um, we looked at basic data types and operators. We looked at how to convert between different data types. We looked at the basic data structures of arrays and hashes that enable you to um, store lots of data in one object. We looked at variables, so assigning values to variables. And then lastly, we looked at output and return and the differences between them. Um, that's quite a lot of information. Um, don't worry if you didn't follow all of it. Um, learning is a circular process. So the more you're exposed to a topic, the, the more you'll absorb it each time. If you don't get it the first time, then keep going through it and it will become more familiar and meaningful. Um, I'd like to give an opportunity for um, people to ask any questions. I've also got one last quiz, um, which I'm more than happy um, to give you. But could you let me know in the chat if you would like that quiz or whether, whether you're all quizzed out and uh, no, you don't need another one of Claire's quizzes. And if you've got any questions, put them in the Q&A. And I promise I won't be offended if no one says, yeah, quiz me more. There is a bit of tumbleweed going on there. Um, oh, yeah, see, I only needed one and now I've got three. So that's all I needed. Thank you, guys. You've made me feel a lot better. <laughs> so here we go. Here is your last quiz for the evening, where it is where I am anyway. Um, give that a go. Yeah, one more just for luck. Absolutely. And for anyone that's got any questions, this is a good opportunity to put them in the Q&A. Just putting a blanket over my lap, I'm getting a bit cold. <laughs> okay, the first person has submitted um, answers, so I can see that the quiz is working. Always a relief. Okay, I'm just going to give another 20 seconds if you'd like longer. Now is your chance to put something in the chat. Um, otherwise, I'm going to pull the plug. Oh, I can see somebody else snuck in there. Oh, 
Oh, thank you, Francisco. I'm glad you've liked the quizzes. Okay, right, let's send that there and have a look at the answers. So here, the here are the answers. So um, which of these are basic types in Ruby? Um, the only two that aren't are number and text. And that's because um, integer and float are effectively the numbers and string is effectively the text. And text would have been a much better word to use, but, uh, you know, string is what is used. So um, the only two that are not basic data types in Ruby are number and string. When we do a symbol to I, try to turn a symbol into an integer, we get an error because there is no method defined for that. Um, when we do a Boolean true, we convert it to a string, we get that um, Boolean value as a string back. So we get true. Question four, um, to store car manufacturers, this is all the same data type. We don't need to label it. So I would use a hat. <laughs> I will use an array. Um, how would we reference the Tweety element in this array? So Tweety is at the um, second, um, it's the second element, so it's the index one. So we would use the middle option um, array of one in the square brackets. And then for question six, if we wanted to reference the value for the author key, we would use the name of the hash, which is book. And then we would put the key value, which in this case is the symbol author in square brackets after it. Um, question seven, when we compare three to 3.0, the different data types, but Ruby knows they're the same value, so it returns true. And then the last one, um, put S, be very quiet, I'm hunting rabbits. Um, that returns nil because put S always returns nil. It outputs whatever's being passed to it, but it always returns nil. So that is all. I haven't had any questions coming. Oh, here's one. Oh, okay. Could you please explain again, why is question three outputting nothing instead of string? Let's go back. So someone is asking about this question here. OK, a little bit concerned. But I don't have a different way of explaining this. I'm clearly not explaining it very well. So I make is it the way that this is formatted? So we've got an expression here. So people are asking why this is. I have already answered this, but somebody has asked me to answer it again. Um, so why is this outputting nothing? So we've got a phrase here, put S, meep, meep. Okay, so that's the phrase, put S, meep, meep. That outputs meep, meep, but it returns nil. So when I do catch phrase and assign it to this expression, I don't assign it to what this expression outputs. I assign it to what it returns and it returns nil. So catch phrase is assigned to nil. And if I output by doing put s catch phrase, um, this outputs nothing because nil represents nothing. It still returns nil because put s always returns nil, but it outputs nothing because nil re um, represents nothing and catchphrase is assigned to nil. Um, so the person that said to me, um, you already answered this one, um, thank you for pointing that out because I think you can't see the question. So you can't see that it's a duplicate question. So I appreciate the heads up and that I might have been repeating myself there. Um, and there's another question. Yeah, okay. So the string to I, whoops, that 
um, returns zero. Um, whereas if you try and do it with a symbol, um, it gives you an error. Um, that is just the way it is. Um, in Ruby, there is a method defined for 2i when you invoke it on a string, but there isn't a method defined for 2i when you invoke it on a symbol. And that's why you get these different things. I mean, why that is, I'm sure someone had a very good reason, um, but it's not obvious to me what that would be because I don't know why you would ever want a string to um, have two I invoked on it and it returns zero if there's anything other than zero. You can take advantage of this when you're solving like code war problems and stuff. Sometimes it's useful that it does that, but personally, I think it would um, make much more sense if it raised an error and said there is no number in the string that you're passing to turn it into an integer. So are you sure that's what you want to do? Right, I've answered that one. So your explanation about catchphrase makes sense, but how would you access the put s meep meep that it was assigned to as it returns and outputs nil? Okay, because I still got that. So put s meep meep is the um, expression. It outputs meet meet, it returns nil. When I do catchphrase equals this, maybe we better if I put it in brackets. So the brackets are optional. So now catchphrase is being assigned to the return of that phrase of that expression. So whatever put s meet meet returns, the value that it returns is being, catchphrase is being assigned to that. And so that is why catchphrase is nil. Does that explain it? Because put s meet meep outputs meet meep, but it returns nil and the nil is captured by catchphrase and stored by catchphrase. I'm hoping that answers the question. Yes, brilliant. Lovely. Satisfied customer, that's what I like. Okay, so I haven't got any more questions to answer. Um, so let's have a quick summary. Um, Oh, I think I've already done this, haven't I? Um, so uh, all I would like you to do is I'm going to um, promote my feedback form again. <laughs> you might get the impression that I'm quite keen for you to fill this out. It's really useful to hear back from students as to what works and what doesn't. And if you've got any ideas for improving it, it, it really helps. And I have changed this um, workshop as I've gone along based on the feedback um, that I've got. Right, I have got another question come in. So a variable is always assigned to what is returned by the right expression, correct. So when a variable is being assigned to an expression, it's actually being assigned to whatever that expression returns. Great question. Okay, so today we've covered data types and variables. Next time we're going to cover methods and variable scope. So methods are reusable chunks of code and variable scope describes where a variable can be used. So really useful concept to um, understand early on. Um, I hope that you've enjoyed this um, workshop um, and I'll see you all next week. Please fill in the feedback form. Um, thank you all for attending, taking part, and you know, thank you for the great questions. It's really, really useful to hear 
the questions from students because I, I'm sure that several of you are all thinking the same thing. And it really gives um, a chance to explore the concepts that we're covering here in the detail in which is useful to students. So these questions that we get throughout these sessions are really useful. Um, so I guess all um, there is for me to say is to enjoy the rest of your day. Have a good have a good weekend. Um, hopefully it's the weekend for some of you. It certainly is for me. And hopefully I will see you next week. I'm going to turn off my camera and microphone, but I'll hang around a little bit for people to grab that feedback form. Hey, take care.